Welcome to our podcast where we tell stories that'll keep you up at night. And in the morning, have you asking? What's sleep? I'm your night. And in the morning, have you asking? What's sleep? I'm your co-host Timothy. And I'm the other host, Bailey. And let's talk about some spooky stories. I'd like to start off this episode by thanking those who have signed up for our Patreon, as well as those who have purchased some of our shirts. It's been really awesome seeing all the support we've gotten and things like that. And also as a reminder, we still are taking submissions for our listener stories that we will be releasing on the 30th of this month. Give me a ghost stories. Yeah, ghost stories, aliens, I don't know, Bigfoot, something. Bad dreams, paranormal, criminal, whatever you got, I want it. All the things. So I guess with that, we will just go ahead and get right into my case, which is... Lizzie Borden. Ooh. Big spook. Oh, yeah. That's a big one. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people know Lizzie Borden. Do you? I've heard, yeah, pretty much the gist, but the gist. I'm ready for the detail. All right. <laughs> I will say it was a struggle finding all of this information. Oh, really? So I hope you will enjoy some of the extra facts that I managed to find. Getting right into it. So Lizzie Andrew Borden was born July 19th of 1860 in Fall River, Massachusetts. What was her middle name? Andrew. Andrew. Yeah. Okay. Oddly enough. Weird. Her mother's name was Sarah Anthony. Uh, she was what? born 1823. And her father was Andrew Jackson Borden. I see where the Andrew came from. Yeah, it's still, it's still a little weird to give that Andrew to, you know, well, a daughter. I mean, if that, was she the only daughter? No, she had a sister. Oh, well. Again, you know, firstborn slash... No son. I don't know. Oh. It is it is weird. You think they would wait for their first for forced, forced. their firstborn before they decided to give her the name, but that's cool. Yeah, whatever works, right? Progressive. <laughs> Through her father, she was of English and Welsh descent. Lizzie's father, Andrew, grew up in very modest surroundings and struggled financially as a young man, despite being the descendant of a wealthy and influential local family. How did he mess that up? I just think he just like, I don't want to take your money type of thing. Oh, I guess. fair. So cool. Self-made man. Exactly. He did eventually prosper in the manufacturing and sale of furniture and caskets and went on to become a successful property developer. He directed several textile mills, including the Globe Yarn Mill Company, Troy Cotton, and Woolen Manufacturing Company. He also owned a considerable amount of commercial property and was both president of the Union Savings Bank and a director of the Durfee Safe Deposit and Trust Company. Busy. So he knew he didn't need all that help. Oh, yeah. You know? He knew what he's he like, was doing. He's like, you know, I got this. I know what steps to take. I'll make it myself. You know, you, know, you got you to respect it. that. I, yeah. do, I do respect it. Good job. Uh, at the time of his death, his estate was valued at $300,000, which in 2019, that was the equivalent of $8.5 million. Good Lord. So he was no stranger to money. Despite his wealth, Andrew was known for his frugality. 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 Frugal. Yeah, very frugal. For instance, the boarding home lacked indoor plumbing and electricity. Nah, 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 nah. Oh, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> yeah. What? He didn't want to pay for it. Okay. So. They're, they're, okay, you can be frugal or you can be crazy. That's well, just Well, I mean, crazy. around that time is when, like, that whole thing was still kind of like a new concept. Yeah, you, you, you are a rich man. You get all the new technology, especially if it's something like, Plumbing and electricity. I, I could see going without electricity, but plumbing, like they had an outhouse. You still got to clean it. They didn't want to pay it. I, I don't guess. know. Whatever. Uh, the residence at ninety two Second Street was in an affluent area, but the wealthiest residents of Fall River, including Andrew's cousins, generally lived in the more fashionable neighborhood, The Hill. Ooh, fancy sounding. Why is it always The Hill? Beverly Hills. I don't know why that old like 2008 song Beverly Hills <laughs> just popped right in my head whenever you said that. I can't think of any more hills. That are Beverly Hills. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Exactly. Okay. I can't think of I anything off the top of my head. <laughs> well, now we know this one in the Massachusetts. Hill. The, Mass the Hills. The Hill of Massachusetts. 
The hill was farther away from the industrial areas of the city and much more homogenous racially, ethnically, and socioeconomic. So not a whole lot of diversity in that area. Yeah. It's essentially like the neighborhood down the down the road from here. Yeah. Have that armed security at the front gate. Ooh. I've been in there once. You know? It was I as remember, bougie as you think it is. I remember when um my sister came down and I was telling her about like the mansions right down the road. And she's like, I want to go look at them. And I was like, well, I mean, they have a security guard, so we can try to say, hey, we're looking for a house or something and see right. if they'll let us in. So we drive up there. She's, you know, this is when I was younger, before mm-hmm. I started driving. Right. So we pull up to the gate and we came up with a plan saying, yeah, we're just going to look for houses, you know, right. seeing what's available. So we pull up, the guard asks, you know, can I help you? And for whatever reason, my sister just flat out said, oh, we're here to look at apartments. Why? You messed You up. messed it up. That you was our never one go opportunity. Back. Yeah, can, so well, unless it's a different guard, but So right down the road is an apartment complex with a similar name. Oh. So Lord. he was like, "Oh no, you're looking for the ones across the street. So go ahead and turn around and leave." Yikes. Like, I was like, "We had <laughs> one job." There was one opportunity to do this. Yeah. You should um, have rehearsed it. Well, I thought I thought it was relatively <laughs> simple. Hey, nope. we're just here to look at houses. No. Nope. But I have been in there freshman and sophomore year. Went to a uh, old middle school friend's birthday party. Yeah. And he had a house in there. Yeah, they're they're pretty big. Ah. I, I went to the one and I don't remember a lot from it because we, we pretty much just stayed in like one room. This was like high school, played video games or whatever. Oh, yeah. Like, just in this one room. But I remember seeing the backyard. and It was huge. And it was like, yo. I think they had like a back, like backyard kitchen area. What? Okay. Yeah. Those are so cool. So <laughs> Borden and her older sister, Emma Lenora Borden, born 1851, had a relatively religious upbringing and attended Central Congressional Church. As a young woman, she was very involved in church activities, including teaching Sunday school to children of recent immigrants to the United States. Oh, relatively nice lady, it seems like. Uh, She was involved in Christian organizations such as the Christian Endeavor Society, for which she served as secretary treasurer in contemporary social movements such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union. So many mouthful of words. She was also a member of the Ladies Fruit and Flower Mission. She was was just into everything. What's the Ladies Fruit and Flower? Do they like grow plants or is that like a literal like? I think it's kind of like a, uh, you know, women empowerment thing. Oh. Kind of. But like, you know, still the whole purity thing. Because, you know, someone's like. Lame. So three years after the death of Lizzie Borden's mother, Sarah. Andrew married Abby Durfee Gray. Uh, Lizzie stated that she called her stepmother Mrs. Borden and demurred on whether they had a cordial relationship. She believed that Abby had married her father for his wealth. Well, maybe. I mean, probably, more than likely. I mean, maybe, maybe not. You know, it doesn't matter. That's up to her Uh, papa and her new stepmama. (laughs) If he's having a good time, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Bridget Sullivan, whom they called Maggie, the Borden's 25-year-old live-in maid who had immigrated to the U.S. from Ireland, testified that Lizzie and Emma rarely ate meals with their parents. I mean, same. I never really ate with my family. They, I think we tried when I was with them, but eventually they were just like, you know, if you're eating, whatever. As long as you're eating. Yeah. Just don't make a mess and wash your dishes. <laughs> uh, but hold on. didn't So they called Bridget by Maggie? Yeah, they called her Maggie. Why? I don't know. Rude. I mean, rich family, little poor maid. It's not her name. They're probably just like, this is what you're going to be called. Wow. I don't know. That's just a guess. I completely just talked out my butt for that one. (laughs) In May 1892, Andrew killed multiple pigeons in his barn with a hatchet, believing they were attracting local children to hunt them. What? (laughs) Yeah. So you're going to save them by killing them slash get rid of the children by also just killing them? I guess he just didn't want children around. You can't trap them and then... Move them across town or release them. I don't know. I feel like that's a lot less work than chopping but off their heads. Here's the thing Lizzie had recently built a roost for the pigeons, and it has oh. been commonly recounted that she was upset over his killing of them, though the veracity of this has been disputed. A family argument in July of 1892 prompted both sisters to take extended, quote, vacations in New Bedford. After returning to Fall River a week before the murders, Lizzie chose to stay in a local rooming house for four days before returning to the family residence. Tension had been growing within the family in the months before the murders, especially over Andrew's gifts of real estate to various branches of Abby's family. After their stepmother's Abby sister, was the, wife, right? the new one, yeah. Okay. So, the so he's just that, giving houses and stuff. Yeah, property. it was just like it's like here's 
valuable property. But he wouldn't pay for plumbing. Right. Okay. So he was just giving away property to this other family for seemingly no reason. <sighs> After their stepmother's sister received a house. Imagine getting a free house, man. I, I can't. Whew. I would never get a free house. If I got a free house, I would probably die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just well, out of sheer appreciation. I honestly, if I, if I had a free house, I would still stay here and then just rent out the house. I mean, I guess, just but. Make money. Just live in the house. I mean, I guess, but like. I'm just saying. It's like know. you can make passive money. Uh, after the stepmother, uh, stepmother's sister received the house, the sisters had demanded and received a rental property, the home they had lived in until their mother died, which they purchased from their father for $1. A few weeks before the murders, they sold the property back to their father for $5,000, which is equivalent <laughs> to about $142,000 today. Yeah. The night Games. before the murders, honestly, though, I was like, <laughs> how? well, one, how is he going to sell it to him for a dollar and then buy it back for $5,000? I don't know. I, that yeah, just seems I, like a bad business move. I, well, yeah, apparently he wasn't very smart about it. Uh, the night before the murders, John Vinicum Morris the brother of Lizzie's and Emma's deceased mother, visited and was invited to stay for a few days to discuss business matters with Andrew. Some writers have speculated that their conversation, particularly about property transfer, may have aggravated an already tense situation. For several right. days before the murders, the entire household had been violently ill. A family friend uh, later speculated that mutton left on the stove for use in meals over several days was the cause, but Abby had feared poisoning as Andrew had not been a proper man. Well... You know what happens when you don't buy a refrigerator with the electricity you don't pay for and you leave meat out for days? You get sick. Well. I believe that they just got sick food poisoning. Probably, honestly. It, that's I mean, if you're, you're going to leave happen. cooked meat out for that long, it's going to get something. Yeah, it, so. unless you like salt it, but like, like the shit out of it. You know? I mean, even then, though. I don't know. Even then, I still think like four days or however long it was. Got to salt it real good. Salt bathe it. <laughs> uh, John Morris arrived in the evening of August 3rd and slept in the guest room that night. After breakfast the next morning, at which Andrew, Abby, Lizzie, Morris, and the Bordens made Bridget were present, Andrew and Morris went to the sitting room where they chatted for nearly an hour. Morris left around 8.48 a.m. to buy a pair of oxen and visit his niece in Fall River, planning to return to the Borden home for lunch at noon. Weird thing. Like, yeah. I'm just going to go out and buy some ox. Well, you know, farming life. I guess. I mean, <laughs> I've done that the, before with horses. Well, horses, horses, like, I understand. But ox, what do you use ox for? Because it said it was a pair. Well, maybe they would use it to like pull equipment. Also that. Maybe. I don't know. There's many uses for We're, farm animals. I didn't grow up on a farm. I don't know. I, <laughs> you know. I know. Although the cleaning of the guest room was one of Lizzie's and Emma's regular chores, Abby went upstairs sometime between 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. to make the bed. According to the forensic investigation, Abby was facing her killer at the time of the attack. She was first struck on the side of the head with a hatchet, which cut her just oh. above the ear, causing her to turn and fall face down on the floor, creating contusions on her nose and forehead. Her killer then struck her multiple times, delivering 17 more direct oh hits to the back of her head, killing her. Ow! When Andrew returned at around 10.30 a.m., his key failed to open the door, so he knocked for attention. Sullivan went to unlock the door, finding it jammed. She uttered an expletive. She later testified that she heard Lizzie laughing immediately after this. She did not see Lizzie, but stated that the laughter was coming from the top of the stairs. This was considered significant as Abby was already dead by this time, and her body would have been visible to anyone on the home's second floor. Lizzie later denied being upstairs and testified that her father had asked her where Abby was. She had replied that a messenger had delivered Abby a summons to visit a sick friend. Okay. I Trying think, to give herself an alibi. Well, my thing is, like, you clearly heard her laugh. Right. From up there. Yeah. And you find a dead body up there. Yeah. Mm. Something happened, you know? We'll never know <laughs> what happened. <laughs> I mean, we do. <laughs> she just wasn't convicted. Exactly. Anyways. Anywho. Lizzie stated that she had then removed Andrew's boots and helped him into his slippers before he laid down on the sofa for a nap. She then informed Sullivan of the department store sale and permitted her to go. But Sullivan felt unwell and went to take a nap in her bedroom instead. Sullivan testified that she was in her third floor room, resting from cleaning windows, when just before 11.10 a.m., she heard Lizzie call from downstairs, Maggie, come quick. Father's dead. Somebody came in and killed him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did. I, I don't know how they got in. I don't know how they got well, in. Well, they killed him when nobody else. I didn't see nothing. <laughs> Andrew was slumped on a couch in the downstairs sitting room, 
struck 10 or 11 times with a hatchet-like weapon. One of his eyeballs had been split cleanly in two, suggesting that he had been asleep when attacked. Jesus. His still bleeding wound suggested a very recent attack. Dr. Uh, Bowen, the family's physician, arrived from his home across the street to determine that both victims had died. I don't know why you need him to come and tell. Yeah, yeah they're dead. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty dead. Uh, detectives estimated his death had occurred at approximately 11 a.m. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess that's what they're referring to. That was like determining time of death. You still gotta announce them dead. Yeah, I guess. Know. It seems kind of redundant at that point. Yeah. Yeah, you know, well, semantics. They're right? certified. <laughs> They're certified. They went to school for this. Exactly. So now we're gonna talk about the investigation into Lizzie Borden. Wide known knowledge that everybody pretty much knows that Lizzie Borden killed her parents. Well, yes. Because she did. Because she did. <laughs> but the whole investigation was just really weird and Men are just dumb. Yes, I <laughs> so, agree. <laughs> uh, Lizzie Borden's initial answers to the police officer's questions were at times strange and contradictory. Initially, she reported hearing a groan or a scraping noise or a distress call before entering the house. Okay. So that was just weird. Yeah. But then two hours later, she told police she had heard nothing and entered the house, not realizing that anything was wrong. Changing your stories, Lizzie. So how are you going to go from, oh, I heard all of this weird stuff to, oh, I didn't hear nothing. I just yeah. came in like nothing happened. Right. Changing your stories. Gotta stick to it. When asked where her stepmother was, she recounted Abby receiving a note asking her to visit a sick friend. She also stated that she thought Abby had returned and asked if somebody could go upstairs and look for her. Sullivan and a neighbor, Miss Churchill, were halfway up the stairs, their eyes level with the floor, when they looked into the guest room and saw Abby lying face down on the floor. Most of the officers who interviewed Borden reported that they disliked her attitude. (laughs) Some said she was too calm and poised. Yeah, that's a little suspicious. Hey, my dad and my stepmom just got hatcheted to death. You know, you're not going to be calm. But most people aren't. Well, I guess, you know, different. I mean, me, okay, me personally, to, I don't yeah. know how I would react if, you know, I came right. in. You know, I'm not saying that this is what happened, but if I just came home and I saw, you know, I'd probably, my parents hatcheted to death, yeah. I don't know how to react. I'd pass out, throw up, and you have to drag me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I probably wouldn't be calm about it. But no, yeah. You know, I guess to each their own in that situation. Despite her attitude and changing alibis, nobody bothered to check her for bloodstains. Police did search her room, but it was a cursory inspection. At the trial, they admitted to not doing a proper search because Borden was not feeling well. They were subsequently criticized for the lack of evidence. Understandably. Yeah. Like You you literally have one job (laughs) and you chose not to do it. Yeah. In the basement, police found two hatchets, two axes, and a hatchet head with a broken handle. The hatchet head was suspected of being the murder weapon as the break in the handle appeared fresh and the ash and dust on the head, unlike that of the other bladed tools, appeared to have been deliberately applied to make it look as if it had been in the basement for some time. Ooh. Gotta give it to Lizzie, though, to think of that far she ahead, tried. though. I mean, she succeeded. Apparently. <laughs> but, you know, that's just something I don't even think I would do. I think about. I don't think so. Like, this looks too clean. If I was a murderer... And I was trying to dispose of my murder weapon. I don't think I'd have it anywhere near the murder scene. Like, I would take that way away. Like, apparently her alibi was to, she was going to what, a, a sick friend's house or something? Uh, The other person, Abby. Oh. The um, Maggie. Oh, Maggie was supposed to be visiting a sick friend. Yeah. Oh, okay. Supposed to be. That was gotcha. the excuse she had for her not being. Gotcha. Okay. Well, either way, I'd still be like, yeah, I went to the store and then like I would drive it very far away, you know, well, dump it in a lake or something. I guess, you know, with the limited amount of time she had, I guess. That's fair. So you didn't have time to do that. But that's a good thing, though. Well, OK, let me rephrase that. Not a good thing that she did it, but it's like it's yeah. smart that she tried to yeah, cover, cover, it, the, up cover it up a little bit. But apparently she didn't do a good enough job. because They were like, that looks too good. <laughs> It looks too dusty. It looks too <laughs> dusty. This is fresh dust. <laughs> However, none of these tools were removed from the house. Okay. To be put into evidence. Th- then it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. It doesn't matter at that point. Because of the mysterious illness that had stricken the household before the murders, the family's milk and Andrew's and Abby's stomachs were, you know, removed during autopsies, were tested for poison. No poison was found in their stomachs. Yeah, I figured as much. So it was just them being sick from... Poisoning. The old meat. Yeah. Residents suspected Lizzie of purchasing hydrocyanic acid in a diluted form from the local drugstore, which, which does. Ha- where do you, 
How do people I, just find this stuff? I feel like it's a chemical in a medicine that Maybe. they didn't name, honestly. Possibility. Like, but like, mm. I feel like a lot of these things, like, yeah, I just went to my local drugstore and bought, and bought arsenic. <laughs> it's like a wash. I think so. Dozo? Dozo's just in the country. It's good. All right, listen. <laughs> okay, so when you said Zozo, I was watching the candle flame. <laughs> the wick would just disappear. Just pull the wick out. Oh Bro, okay, listen, you're making me real paranoid. <laughs> like not I'm not on. making you paranoid. The water noise making you paranoid. <laughs> what was I going to say? I don't remember. What talking about, about? talking about the local drugstore stuff. Oh, yeah. So what I was going to say is like, I, I don't know if for some reason, I just like the word acetaminophen. So every time I'm like, I need to go get some acetaminophen or I need to take some acetaminophen. It's just Tylenol or Aleve. Mm-hmm. It's just, That's just painkiller, you know? It's the active ingredient in painkillers. Gotta go get me some acetaminophen. I say, it, like, it's a fun word to say. Anyway. <laughs> you just sound like a drug dealer. <laughs> I know what it means. Are you a drug dealer? No. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want ibuprofen, I got that. <laughs> got that good, good. Technically, that's drugs. <laughs> got me there. <laughs> uh, she defended that she inquired about the acid so she could clean her furs, despite the local me- uh, medical examiner's testimony that it did not have what? antiseptic properties. Some acid to clean her furs. Okay. Kind of like a washing agent. I, I guess. I, I, guess. I, just... I don't know. Uh, Lizzie and Emma's friend Alice Russell decided to stay with them the night following the murders while Moore spent the night in the attic guest room, contrary to later accounts that he slept in the murder site guest room. Police were stationed around the house on the night of August 4th, during which an officer said he had seen Borden enter the cellar with Russell carrying a kerosene lamp and a slop pail. He stated he saw both women exit the cellar, after which Borden returned alone, though he was unable to see what she was doing. He stated it appears she was bent over the sink. On August 5th, Morris left the house and was mobbed by hundreds of people. Police had to escort him back to the house. On August 6th, police conducted a more thorough search of the house, inspecting the sisters' clothing, confiscating the broken-handled hatchet head. And that evening, a police officer and the mayor visited the Bordens, and Lizzie was informed that she was a suspect in the murders. The next morning, Russell entered the kitchen to find Borden tearing up a dress. She explained that she was planning to put it uh, put it on the fire because it was covered in paint. It was never determined whether it was the dress she had been wearing on the day of the murder. It was. So, my thing is, is that suspicious activity? Yeah, like literally, like two days after this whole murder right. thing, you're gonna burn a dress. Oh, it's just paint. Sure, okay. color paint, Lizzie. Okay. Was it red? Because I bet you're gonna say it's red. Red rock. <sighs> red rock. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so now we're gonna go into the inquest for Lizzie. Okay. Uh, Borden appeared at the inquest hearing on August 8th. Her her request to have her family attorney present was refused under a state statute providing that an inquest must be held in private. Well, doesn't she need an attorney for her case? Uh, For, like, the actual, like, trial. This is just an inquest. Okay. But I don't know. And it it did say it's a state statute. Seems weird. So I'm not sure what that entails. Mm. I mean, all you got to do is just not say nothing. Yeah, just literally keep quiet. Just literally say nothing. What are they going to do? It's painting. (laughs) Uh, She had been prescribed regular doses of morphine to calm her nerves, which... Lit. (laughs) (laughs) Morphine should not be used in that way. No. And it is possible that her testimony was affected by this. Yeah. Of course. She was high. (laughs) Oh, yeah. She was out of it. It was like, at that time I had the accident and the cop came in asking me questions as I was getting dosed with morphine. Yeah. So, like, literally, he was, like, I was in the middle of speaking a sentence on what happened, and then it all just hit me, and I just went, (laughs) (laughs) Just, yeah, that was an interesting time. Her behavior was erratic, and she often refused to answer a question, even if the answer would be beneficial to her. She often contradicted herself and provided alternating accounts of the morning in question, such as saying she was in the kitchen reading a magazine when her father arrived home, then saying she was in the dining room doing some ironing, then saying she was coming down the stairs. Lizzie. Yeah. Like, like, she can't hold a story yeah. to keep her life. Pick one and stick to it. <laughs> no. Too complicated. <laughs> she also said she removed her father's boots and put slippers on him. While police uh, photographs clearly showed him wearing his boots. Mm-hmm. Which, in this picture, you can clearly see. Oh, yeah. He's, he's definitely wearing his boots. The famous couch. Yeah. Hey, wait. Uh-oh. And he's still wearing, like, his full suit, too. So, yeah. like, that doesn't seem like good nap attire. Yeah. But okay. What do I know? Lizzie. Lying. Oh, 100%. <laughs> uh, 
obviously though it's all circumstantial that you can't just prove. well i guess that's not circumstantial it's like he's wearing boots so I mean, that's she just said she put slippers on him so. yeah but so boots. yeah i guess that's a lie it is a lie the district attorney was very aggressive and confrontational on august 11th borden was served with a warrant of arrest and jail the inquest testimony, the basis for the modern debate regarding her guilt or innocence, was later ruled inadmissible at her trial in June of 1893. Contemporaneous newspaper articles noted that Borden possessed a, quote, stolid demeanor and bit her lips, flushed, and bent toward attorney Adams. What? Okay. Like, trying to, uh, yeah. you know, do her thing. Yeah. Okay. Get it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> it was also reported that the testimony provided in the inquest had, quote, caused a change of opinion among her friends who have heretofore strongly maintained her innocence. The inquest received significant press attention nationwide, including an extensive three-page write-up in the Boston Globe. A grand jury began hearing evidence on November 7th, and Borden was indicted on December 2nd. So now we'll go over her trial and eventual acquittal. (laughs) She got away with it. Unfortunately. (laughs) Borden's trial took place in New Bedford starting on June 5th of 1893. Prosecuting attorneys were Hosea M. Knowlton and future United States Supreme Court Justice William H. Moody. Defending were Andrew Jennings, Melvin Adams, and former Massachusetts Governor George D. Robinson. Five days before the trial's commencement on June 1st, another axe murder occurred in in Fall River. This time, the victim was Bertha Manchester, who was found hacked to death in her kitchen. Wow. The similarities between the Manchester and Borden's murders were striking and noted by jurors. However, Jose Correa de Mello, I completely butchered that, Mm -hmm. uh, was a Portuguese immigrant, was later convicted of Manchester's murder in 1894, and was determined not to have been in the vicinity of Fall River at the time of the Borden murders. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) A prominent point of discussion in the trial was the hatchet head found in the basement, which was not convincingly demonstrated by the prosecution to be the murder weapon. Prosecutors argued that the killer had removed the handle because it would have been covered in blood. One officer testified that a hatchet handle was found near the hatchet head, but another officer contradicted this. When Mm. no bloody clothing was found at the scene, Russell testified that on August 8th, 1892, she had witnessed Borden burn a dress in the kitchen stove. The thing had been ruined when she brushed against wet paint. During the course of the trial, defense never attempted to challenge that statement. Of course they didn't. What is their job here? Uh, to gawk at women. Apparently. Uh, Lizzie Borden's presence at the home was also a point of dispute during the trial. According to testimony, Sullivan entered the second floor of the home at around 10.58 a.m. and left Lizzie and her father downstairs. Lizzie told several people that at this time, she went into the barn and was not in the house for, quote, 20 minutes or possibly half an hour. Hyman Lubinsky testified for the defense that he saw Lizzie Borden leaving the barn at 11 a.m. This is so specific. Like, it really is. I don't know what I did at 11.03 this morning. What? Well, I mean, I guess like it's kind of mostly like the police. I'm sure they like jot down specific I mean, timings. I guess. It's just too specific. But a second person, Charles Gardner, did confirm that time. Oh, at 11.10 okay. a.m., Lizzie called Sullivan downstairs, told her Andrew had been murdered, and ordered her not to enter the room. Instead, Borden sent her to get a doctor. Both victims' heads had been removed during an autopsy, and the skulls were admitted as evidence during the trial and presented on June 5th, 1893. They put their heads on the trial for the the jury? What? Upon seeing them in the courtroom, Borden fainted. Evidence was excluded that Borden had sought to purchase acid, uh, Prusik acid more specifically, purportedly for cleaning a sealskin cloak from a local druggist on the day before the murders. The judge ruled that the incident was too remote in time to have any connection. Oh, she got away with that. Yeah. The presiding associate justice, Justin Dewey, who had been appointed by Robinson when he was governor, delivered a lengthy summary that supported the defense as his charge to the jury before it was sent to deliberate on June 20th of 1893. After an hour and a half of deliberation, the jury acquitted Borden of the murders. Upon exiting the courthouse, she told reporters she was, quote, the happiest woman in the world. Wow. Interesting. After your parents. After you really murdered your parents. Mm-hmm. The trial had been compared to the later trials of Bruno Hopman, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, and O.J. Simpson as a landmark in publicity and public interest in the history of American legal proceedings. Right. That's that. She got away with it. Yeah. So now we're going to get into some speculation. Let's do it. This will be the fun part. I speculate she did it. <laughs> That's just facts. 
Although acquitted at trial, Borden remains the prime suspect in her father's and stepmother's murders. Writer Victoria Lincoln proposed in 1967 that Borden might have committed the murders while in a fugue state. Okay. I think she just did it. I mean, yeah. Yeah. She was just, <laughs> she was just mad. Another prominent suggestion was that she was physically and sexually abused by her father, which drove her to kill him. Oh. That wouldn't explain why she killed the stepmother. Yeah. At that point. Like, yeah. Why would she kill the stepmother and then him? Right. That's the thing. There is little to, uh, evidence to support this, but incest is not a topic that would have been discussed at the time, and the methods for collecting physical evidence would have been quite different in 1892. This belief was intimated, uh, in, yeah. This belief was intimated in local papers at the time of the murders and was revisited by scholar Marcia Carlisley in 1992 essay. Mystery author Ed McBain, in his 1984 novel *Lizzie*, suggested that Borden committed the murders after being caught in a lesbian tryst with Sullivan. Ooh. McBain elaborated on the, his speculation in a 1999 interview, speculating that Abby had caught Lizzie and Sullivan together and had reacted with horror and disgust, and that Lizzie had killed Abby with a candlestick. A candlestick? Mm-hmm. Okay. What? Okay. <laughs> when Andrew returned, she had confessed to him, but killed him in a rage with a hatchet when he reacted exactly as Abby had. McBain further speculates that Sullivan disposed of the hatchet somewhere afterwards. In her later years, Borden was rumored to be a lesbian, but there was no such speculation about Sullivan, who found other employment after the murders and later married a man she met while working as a maid. And uh, I'm going to butcher this. Uh, Boot, Montana. Butte. But, Butte. It's Butte. Butte, Montana. Mm-hmm. Uh, she died in Butte in 1948, where she allegedly gave a deathbed confession to her sister, stating that she had changed her testimony on the stand in order to protect Gordon. So if that's not evidence enough that Lizzie did it. <laughs> <laughs> Another significant suspect is John Morse, Lizzie's maternal uncle, who rarely met with the family after his sister died, but had slept in the house the night before the murders. Oh. According to law enforcement, Morris had provided a, quote, absurdly perfect and over-detailed alibi for the death of Abby Borden. What was his alibi? Oh. I couldn't find it. Okay. But, like, you know how you were talking about earlier with, like, the times, like, this is so specific. Right. So it must have been, like, very specific to the point where it made everybody, like, that's too Yeah, that's, that's too, that's too on the nose, my friend. Uh, he was considered a suspect by police for a period. Others noted as potential suspects in the crimes include Sullivan, possibly in retaliation for being ordered to clean the windows on a hot day. Really weird way to just get mad enough to kill somebody. <laughs> the day of the murders was unusually hot, and at the time she was still recovering from the mystery illness that had struck the household. A, it quote, was food poisoning! It was just food poisoning, <laughs> but... A quote, William Borden, suspected to be Andrew's illegitimate son, was noted as a possible suspect by writer Arnold Brown. Who surmised in his book, Lizzie Borden, The Legend, The Truth, The Final Chapter, that William had tried and failed to extort money from his father. However, author Leonard Rebello did extensive research on the William Borden in Brown's book, and he was able to prove he was not Andrew Borden's son. Although Emma had an alibi at Fairhaven, crime writer Frank Spearing proposed in his 1984 book, Lizzie, that she might have secretly visited the residence to kill her parents before returning to Fairhaven to receive the telegram informing her of murders so much drama yeah this is just one big family drama that just led to tragedy two two people dying yeah so now we'll go ahead and talk about lizzie later in life after she got acquitted and all this stuff Mm -hmm. so after the trial the borden sisters moved into a large modern house in the hill neighborhood in fall river around this time lizzie began using the name lizbeth a borden at their new house which lizbeth dubbed maplecroft they had a staff that included live-in maids, uh, a housekeeper, and a coachman. Because Abby was ruled to have died before Andrew, her estate went first to Andrew, and then at his death, passed oh. to his daughters as part of his estate. Oh. A considerable settlement, however, was paid to settle claims by Abby's family. So she did get a good part of his estate, right? but, you know, like a lot of the money kind of. So, yeah, yeah settlements yeah. and whatnot. Despite the acquittal, Gordon was ostracized by Fall River Society. Her name was again brought into the public eye when she was accused of shoplifting in 1897 in Providence, Rhode Island. In 1905, shortly after an argument over a party that Elizabeth had given for actress Nance O'Neill, Emma moved out of the house. She never saw her sister again. Whoops. Yeah, I guess. Don't don't be a scumbag. (laughs) Yeah. Don't murder people. So now we'll get into uh, Lizzie for her death. Borden was ill in her last year following the removal of her gallbladder. 
She died in, of pneumonia on June 1st, 1927 in That's Fall River. Nice. Funeral details were not published and few attended. Nine days later, Thanks. Emma died from chronic nephritis at the age of 76 at a nursing home in Newmarket, New Hampshire. Having moved to this location in 1923, both for health reasons and to avoid renewed publicity of following the publication of another book about the murders. Right. The sisters, neither of whom had ever married, were buried side by side in the family plot in Oak Grove Cemetery. At the time of her death, uh, Borden was worth over $250,000, so equivalent to $4.9 million in today's yeah. money. She owned a house on the corner of French Street and Belmont Street, several office buildings, shares in several utilities, two cars, and a large amount of jewelry. She left $30,000, equivalent to about $600,000, to the Fall River Animal Rescue League. Oh. And $500. Well, she did something good for and she somebody. did something, I guess. Still doesn't make up for well, it. Well, no, but... <laughs> and she left $500,000, which is about $10,000. Or sorry, she left $500 which is about $10,000 in today's money, and trust for perpetual care of her father's grave. Her closest friend and a cousin each received $6,000, about $119,000 today, uh, substantial sums at the time of the estate's distribution in 1927, and numerous friends and family members each received between $1,000 and $5,000, or about $200,000 to $999,000. Right. Talk about a little bit like kind of what kind of impact Lizzie Borden has had on today's society. Scholar Anne Schofield notes that, quote, Borden's story has tended to take one or the other of two fictional forms, a tragic romance and a feminist quest. As the story and of the Lizzie Borden quest. and the feminist quest. <laughs> okay. As the story of Lizzie Borden has been created and recreated through rhyme and fiction and has taken on the qualities of a popular American myth or legend that effectively links the present to the past. Now, the Borden house is now a museum and operates as a bed and breakfast with 1890 styling. Pieces of evidence used in the trial, including the axe head, are preserved at the Fall River Historical Society. Crazy. So, if you want, you can just go pay Look for a it. night at the Borden house. Yeah, I'm good. I'm pretty sure they actually still have the couch that um, yeah, her I father heard, was killed on. I heard you're able to, like, sit on it and, you know. Which I'm not about. Uh, like, somebody died there, man. So, last thing we'll go ahead and go over. Is there a, a folk rhyme that was made about Lizzie Borden? Tell me. The case was memorialized in a popular skipping rope rhythm. Okay. Or a skipping rope rhyme. Sorry. It's our messed up. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> so it goes, Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. So folklore says that the rhyme was made up by an anonymous, anonymous writer as a tune to sell newspapers. What? Others attribute it to ubiquitous, but anonymous, quote, Mother Goose. Mother Goose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't that like a, like a book? Yeah. Okay. In reality, yeah, Borden's stepmother suffered 18 or 19 blows. Her father suffered 11. The rhyme has a less well-known second verse. Andrew Borden now is dead. Lizzie hit him in the head. Up in heaven he will sing. On the gallows she will swing. Jeez. It's morbid it's as hell. It's very morbid. But... That wow. right there is the conclusion of Lizzie Borden. People are messed up. Yeah, well, she I did wanna... kill people. Well, okay, yeah, Lizzie did it, obviously, 100%. but the rhyme is what's, I don't know, that was the most morbid part for me. Ugh. But, you know, kids will be kids, or Mother Goose will be Mother Goose, or whatever. <laughs> but that will conclude today's episode. I hope you guys did enjoy. If you'd like to find more, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you decide to get your podcast from. So give us a follow and a like on there. Uh, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts if you really enjoyed this. Share with your friends. Yeah. Tell them about us. If you're into crime or conspiracy or ghosts, aliens, you know, all that stuff. All of the above. Tell them to come check us out. And if they have stories, if you don't have a story, send us their stories. Yeah, you can actually submit some stories, whether they're fictitious or real over to us at our email at whatsleeppodcast at gmail.com. Uh, we plan on having a listener episode come out on the 30th of this month for the great day of Halloween. Woo! Woo! Spooky. So. I'm excited. We plan to feature <laughs> about three people or so, so go ahead and get those in. Yep. And if you want to keep your name omitted, that's totally fine. But please email yeah. us there. And if you want to follow us and keep, keep up to date on any sort of news or a little bit of extras to each case be sure to follow us on instagram facebook 
Reddit at What Sleep Podcast. And we also have a Twitter. You can find us there at What Sleep Pod. Yes. And also just to reiterate, we are selling merch. You can find that in any links on our social medias. And yeah. we also have a Patreon now. We still have t-shirts to go, guys. Yeah. Not a lot, so get on it. But <laughs> We do have a Patreon where you can choose every month to donate $5 to us and help us keep up with the payments for this kind of yeah. stuff because it is not cheap. Working on getting another microphone to get some better quality episodes for you guys. Yeah. We're, right now we're working off of one microphone. <laughs> yeah. You can't tell. $5 a month there if you so choose and you can cancel it anytime. We really appreciate the support. And also... <laughs> If you do decide to submit, uh, subscribe to our Patreon, you will get a 15% off coupon code for our uh, little store. So you can buy any merch for 15% off, which I think is a pretty good deal. Discounts. Yeah. Again, that ends today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll catch you in the next one.